Receivership of the Rule 59 of the Rules of Court. Receivership is a provisional or ancillary remedy wherein the court appoints a receiver to receive and preserve the property or fund in litigation pendente liti when it does not seem reasonable to the court that either party should hold it. The purpose of receivership as a provisional remedy is to protect and preserve the rights of the parties during the pendency of the main action. This is also aimed at preservation or making more secure existing rights. It cannot be used as an instrument for the destruction of those rights. The receivership under Rule 59 refers to the property which is the subject of the main action. It does not refer to receivership authorized under the banking laws and other rules or laws. This presupposes that there is an action and that the property subject of the action requires its preservation. Who is a receiver? He is a person appointed by the court on behalf of all the parties to the action for the purpose of preserving and conserving the property in litigation and preventing its possible destruction or dissipation if it were left in the possession of any of the parties. When may a receiver be appointed? First, when it appears from the verified application and such other proofs, the court may require that the party applying for the appointment of a receiver has an interest in the property or fund which is the subject of the action or proceeding and that such fund or property is in danger of being lost, removed, or materially injured unless a receiver be appointed to administer and preserve it. Or second, when it appears in an action by a mortgagee for the foreclosure mortgage that the property is in danger of being wasted or dissipated or materially injured and its value is probably insufficient to discharge the mortgage debt or that the parties have so stipulated in the contract of mortgage. Or third, after judgment, to preserve the property during the pendency of an appeal or to dispose of it according to the judgment or to aid execution when the execution has been returned unsatisfied or the judgment obliger refuses to apply his property in satisfaction of the judgment or otherwise to carry the judgment into effect. Or fourth, whenever in other cases it appears that the appointment of a receiver is the most convenient and feasible means of preserving, administering, or disposing of the property in litigation. Let's have an example. Joaquin filed a complaint against Jose for the foreclosure mortgage of a furniture factory with a large number of machinery and equipment. During the pendency of the foreclosure suit, Joaquin learned from reliable sources that Jose was also engaged in furniture manufacturing such that, from confirmed reports Joaquin gathered, the machinery and equipment left with Jose were no longer sufficient to answer for the latter's mortgage indebtedness. In the meantime, Judgment was rendered by the court in favor of Joaquin, but the same is not yet final. Knowing what Jose has been doing, if you were Joaquin's lawyer, what action would you take to preserve whatever remaining machinery and equipment left with Jose? Suggested answer is to preserve whatever remaining machinery and equipment left with Jose, Joaquin's lawyer should file a verified application for the appointment by the court of one or more receivers. The rules provide that receivership is proper in an action by the mortgagee for the foreclosure mortgage when it appears that the property is in danger of being wasted or dissipated or materially injured and that its value is probably insufficient to discharge the mortgage debt. What are the requirements for appointment of a receiver? Number one, there must be a verified application which must be filed by the party applying for the appointment of a receiver. The applicant must have an interest in the property or fund subject of the action. Second, the applicant must show that the property or funds is in danger of being lost, wasted, or dissipated. Third, there must be notice and hearing. Number four, before issuing the appointment of a receiver, the court shall require the applicant to post a bond in favor of the adverse party. When the receiver is appointed, the receiver shall take his oath, but for doing so, he shall file a bond. So that's why there are two kinds of bonds, the applicant's bond and the receiver's bond. And lastly, before entering upon his duties, the receiver must be sworn to 
perform his duties faithfully. What are the two kinds of bonds in receivership? First is the bond filed by the applicant in an amount fixed by the court to the effect that the applicant will pay such party all damages he may sustain by reason of the appointment of such receiver and the bond filed by the receiver himself in such sum as the court may direct to the effect that he will faithfully discharge his duties in the actual proceeding and obey the orders of the court. When may receivership be denied or lifted? Number one, if the appointment sought or granted is without sufficient cause. Number two, if the adverse party files a sufficient bond to answer for damages. Number three, when the bond posted by the applicant for the grant of receivership is insufficient. Or number four, if the bond of the receiver is insufficient. What are the general powers of a receiver? Subject to the control of the court in which the action or proceeding is pending, a receiver shall have the power to bring and defend in such capacity actions in his own name, to take and keep possession of the property in controversy, to receive rents, to collect debts due to himself as a receiver, to compound for or compromise the same, to make transfers, to pay outstanding debts, to divide the money and other property that shall remain among the persons legally entitled to receive the same, and generally to do such acts representing the property as the court may authorize. However, the funds in the hands of a receiver may be invested only by order of the court upon written consent of all the parties to the action. When may receivership be terminated? Whenever the court, moto proprio or on motion of either party, shall determine that the necessity for receiver no longer exists. So the court shall, after due notice to all interested parties and hearing, settle the accounts of the receiver, direct the delivery of the funds and other property in his possession to the person adjudged to be entitled to receive the same, and order the discharge of the receiver from further duty as such. So here, the court shall allow the receiver such reasonable compensation as circumstances of the case warrant, to be taxed as cost against the defeated party or apportioned as justice requires. As a final reminder, receivership is a harsh remedy to be granted with at most circumspection and only in extreme situations. So before appointing a receiver, courts should consider whether or not the injury resulting from such appointment would unduly be greater than the injury ensuing if the status quo is left undisturbed, and whether or not the appointment will imperil the interests of other parties whose rights deserve as much a consideration from the court as those of the person requesting for receivership. A receiver should not be appointed to deprive a party who is in possession of the property in litigation, just as a writ of preliminary injunction should not be issued to transfer property in litigation from the possession of one party to another where legal title is in dispute and the party having possession asserts ownership in himself, except in a very clear and evident usurpation. And that ends our discussion for receivership under Rule 59. Thank you and have a great day.